Welcome to the Symbols and Society lecture, Symbols and Categories, in which I uh, explain and introduce Douglas's ideas about what is filthy and disgusting and how this arises in different cultures. To start with, we might think of uh, what is disgusting in terms of food and English food categories, where the frog is not considered uh, cuisine, not considered something that should be eaten. Now the way using Douglas's ideas we can explain this is that English have different food categories of land animals and fish. Um, I could call land animals turf and fish surf if you think of the Australian hamburger surf and turf which ingeniously combines fish and beef. Um, so we could have the categories of turf and surf and also then freshwater fish as well. But the, while those three things are turf, surf and freshwater animals are considered edible and fine to eat. There's no category for amphibious animals like the frog that begin in the water and end up on land and can actually alter in between both. And so that's according to Douglas why we find them disgusting that they defy the established categories in England at least for eating. They, um, they don't belong to any category so they're thought of as disgusting and not to be eaten. Um, similarly Leaving aside the question of food, just what is more generally disgusting, we could look at the cockroach in Western cultures more generally. Um, most uh, people in, in Australia where I live find cockroaches pretty disgusting. Now the way Douglas would explain this is, well, in Australia and many other cultures, uh, you have an idea of clear separation of inside the home and outside the home. And there are certain insects that are inside the home like moths and certain that are outside like butterflies. And they tend to stay in their realms, but an animal like the cockroach transgresses the realms and goes from outside to in with ease. And according to Douglas's theory, this is why we would find them disgusting, that they transgress the categories of inside and out. Now what is interesting, of course, is that what is thought of as disgusting differs in different cultures. So we know frogs are eaten in, for example, French cuisine, or Chinese cuisine. So Douglas would say that's because in France and China they have different categories of uh, food or cuisine. And similarly cockroaches are eaten in Thailand so they'd have different categories of insects and other animals in Thailand which would make the cockroach edible. So the main point then comes from Douglas's idea and she was did her field work among the Lele in southwest Congo and what were the ideas we're drawing on particularly come from her work, The Abominations of Leviticus. So she observes in that um, article uh, that pollution beliefs are universal, that all societies have, have pollution beliefs, and they're characterised by attempts to avoid or clean or exterminate the dirty things. Hence, we try to, a lot of people avoid frogs in England and in Australia, we try to exterminate cockroaches. So... The idea that comes from Douglas is that um, these things are considered abomination or dirty or polluted because they don't fit into the systems or order that we've created out of the world. So this goes back to a deeper symbolic idea that um, the, the, the sense or order we make is socially constructed. That it doesn't naturally, there's no sort of that human systems of ideas and languages and symbols don't naturally reflect the world. As a result of this, what is disgusting in one culture could be fine to eat in another. And that's why uh, cockroaches could be disgusting for Australians because we have these certain categories, the way we've divided up the world, and the way people have divided up the world in Thailand is different, which makes cockroaches, I think it's Thailand, I'm sure, one country or other cockroaches are fine to eat. And that would be because, if you use Douglas's analysis, there are different uh, ways of ordering or breaking up or dividing the world in conceptually. So the problem really is how humans create order out of the world and what um, Douglas does is analyze on symbols and focus particular on, particularly on those symbols which challenge the order which don't fit into the symbolic order. Her approach is holistic. She says for example we can't understand the pig prohibition amongst, say, Muslims and Jews without looking at the whole society. And you probably realise this, of course, but Jews, uh, or observant Jews, religiously observant Jews and Muslims are prohibited to eat pork. So what she's trying to say is defilement is never isolated, that what is disgusting or yucky is never 
inherent to the thing itself, the pig or the cockroach or whatever, but rather refers back to the larger system of order or, or of breaking up the world or of dividing the world or of making sense of the world. And we should note that her approach is textual when she's writing in this, The Abomination of Leviticus, she looks at the Bible in particular as a text and she doesn't base her base it so much on field work. So the analysis is based on texts, not so much on field work. So the, the specific problem she looks at is ancient uh, Jewish laws of diet and sacrifice. So, uh, for example, Jews, ancient religiously observant Jews, could not eat pork, nor could they sacrifice pork in the temple to their god. So she wants to understand why certain animals are abominations and why they are avoided and why others are holy. So she looks at the Jewish Bible, which is basically for Christians, the Old Testament. Um, for Jews, it's um, the Ta Torah and Tanakh and one other book. And she analyzes them. Um, so it's not based, as I said, on field work. And the answer she comes up with, to repeat, is that certain animals are considered abominable in certain cultures because they confuse established categories. So she looks at um, Jewish life pre-exile. So this is before the Romans kicked the Jews out of um, the, Israel, the area of Israel. And she looks at um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, which is what in Christianity are the first, the, the Christian names were the first five books of the Bible. Uh, Jewish people have different names, for example, Genesis is Bereshit and so on. So she looks at the uh, Torah and um, or the, and those five books of the Torah, which is one of the three sections of the Tanakh, the, the, old, the Christian Old Testament. And she looks in particular in relation to the Jewish temple, which was a place of sacrifice for the Jews um, pre-Exodus. Uh, pre so if you ever wondered... If you go to, if you take a flight to Israel, you'll land at an airport and then I think uh, somewhere between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, then you get in your car and drive to Jerusalem, which is pictured here. And then you can go to this area, um, which is near the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the third most holy site for Muslims. And this mosque is built on uh, the place where the Jewish, ancient Jewish peoples had used to have a temple. And in fact, all that remains, or well, all that is clearly visible in terms of the remains of that temple is this wall here, which is called the Western Wall. So you'll find Jewish people worshipping the remains of the temple here and amazingly Muslim people worshipping up here. Um, so on a map of um, ancient Israel, you'd find the temple, the old, the old temple over here. So now, Jewish people in the old days, before the destruction of the temple, um, the second destruction of the temple, would go up here and uh, worship God and sacrifice certain animals. But they couldn't sacrifice pork or eat pork. Now, there, if, you ask a, if you ask different people, why can't Jewish people eat pork, you get different answers. If you speak to an Orthodox Jew, they might say, oh, it's because um, there's a religious leader, the Lord, um, you, can't, you can't write, G-O-D together, so he or she would just say that, um, what did they say? I don't know. The Lord commanded it. You might talk to other people who say the reason why Jews don't eat pork is um, hygiene. Back in the old days, there wasn't um, refrigeration, so meat could make people ill, so it was better to avoid it. Um, then you have an aesthetic argument. People say, oh, the reason why we don't eat pork is because they eat feces, they eat um, human excrement, and they live in human excrement. And then there's an argument from an anthropologist, from the ecological anthropologist like uh, Marvin Harris, who says the reason why we don't eat pork is that they compete with humans for resources. So, for example, in New Guinea, if the, pork, if the pigs break out of the sty, they go and eat the um, tubers, the, the sort of like the potatoes, the sweet potatoes and so on that people would eat anyway. So they compete with us for our food. And unlike other useful animals like sheep, which give us both wool and meat or cows which give us leather and milk or camels which give us um, not only a, uh, a ride and also milk etc etc all we get from from um, pigs is meat and that's why the Jews didn't eat it now there you could critique all of these reasons and I'm sure Mary Douglas would she says the reason that we can, that the ancient Jews couldn't eat pork emerges from the categories. So we know that the ancient Jews couldn't eat pork from different sections. Deuter Deuteronomy, for example, I'll skip. These are the animals you may eat for 
five, six. Every animal that has parts of the hoof, hoof and has the hoof cloven in two and choose the cud among these animals you may eat. So um, basically what this means from Deuteronomy is that you can, if, if the hoof is, um, has different parts or is cloven or, or seems to be broken into two, have to have two bits to it, and it chews the cud, which means it um, regurgitates its food and, and re, re, uh, uh, re-digests it, then you can eat it. So basically you need to have um, two parts of the hoof and two parts of the eating process. You can eat those ones. That's what Deuteronomy 14 is saying. And, and that's repeated uh, in Leviticus 11. So let's have a look at what these are. So if you look at things like um, bovines, which are cow-like animals, goats, sheep, and antelope, those animals have a two-part eating process. They uh, eat first, they regurgitate it, and then they, eat, then they digest it a second time. So that's, uh, they have a two-part eating process and they have a two-part hoof. You can see um, the cow's hoof looks as like it have one part here and one part there, so it's broken in two. So according to ancient categories, two-part eating process and two-part hoof, that's good, that's fine, that's whole, that's holy. You can, you can eat it yourself and you can sacrifice it to God. Now what you can't eat, we go to Deuteronomy 14, all those that chew the cud and have the hoof cloven, you shall not eat these. Sorry. Of those, once more time. Of those that chew the cud or have the hoof cloven, you shall not eat these. The camel, the hare, and the rock badger, because they chew the cud but do not part the hoof. So they have a two part eating process, digesting process, but only a one part hoof. And the pig, by contrast, you cannot eat either if you're an ancient Jew because it has a two-part hoof but only has a one-part eating process. Like humans, it just eats and then digests and then, um, <laughs> and then defecates. So, um, and this is backed up in Leviticus 11. The camel, because it chews the cud, has a two-part eating process but does not part the hoof. Its hoof appears to be one single thing, is clear. And the rock badger, because it chews the cud, but does not part the hoof, it has a two-part eating process, but only a one-part hoof that's unclean for you too. So just to repeat, if you're an ancient Jew, if you have an animal with a two-part eating process, it, it eats um, and then sort of vomits it up and redigests it, and it has a two-part hoof, its, its hoof or foot appears to be broken into two or more bits, then it's fine to eat. But it's not fine to eat if it has a two-part two eating process and a um, one-part hoof, or if it has a two-part hoof and only one-part eating process. And that's a problem with the pig, because it appears to have a two-part hoof, but it has only uh, a one-part eating process. So there's a pig's foot, and there's the pig's eating process. It just goes, comes in and then goes out. The camel is a ruminator. It's a ruminant. It, it eat basically. It, that's the term for what I've been talking about, which is to eat and vomit and regur so eat, regurgitate, and eat again. So a ruminant eats grass, regurgitates it, and then um, digests it again. So the camel has a two-part eating process, but its hoof appears to be one thing, does not appear to be cloven hoofed. Therefore, you cannot eat that. So pig is, is disgusting because it doesn't fit into the category. The category for eating things is two-part digestion, two-part hoof. Pig is two-part hoof, but one-part eating process. Camel is two-part eating process, but one part hoof. So those two animals, if you're an ancient Jew, you may not eat. So another example comes from uh, 
from this section of the Bible. Of all the, of all that are in the waters, you may eat these. Whatever has fish, has, has fins and scales, you may eat. So like a normal fish, like a snapper you can eat, or a whiting. Uh, and whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It is unclean for you. So obviously the Jews didn't have a clear category for things like dolphins, eels, and whales with smooth skin. Um, so therefore, uh, they cannot be eaten. And maybe for Australians too, there's a similar thing. We cannot eat uh, whales and dolphins because we think of edible surf animals as only being those with fish, uh, with, with fins, I should say. Um, and we'll skip the 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 uh, birds because I'm already pushing my understanding of biology. The general idea biology is right. that uh, holy animals for the ancient Jews were animals which confirmed God's orders. They were symbols of God's oneness and wholeness, etc. So the lamb, and this is more for Christians, but also for, for ancient Jews too. The lamb had a two-part hoof. His feet came in two bits. And also its digestion came in two bits, eating, regurgitating, and ruminating. So um, the two-part process of eating and two-part hoof is a whole animal. Whereas um, pigs and camels, which don't have those two, two characteristics, did not conform to the order and therefore threatened God's order. And this is why they were thought to be disgusting or, or um, at least inedible. So... To reiterate, the general point is that things which cross boundaries or transgress boundaries or don't fit into the order are dirty, such as flies, cockroaches, mice, uh, uh, dirt when it comes inside the house, or they are abominations such as pigs and uh, weeds. So this has a kind of uh, social, important social applications or implications too, because we can see that in many cultures, things that which cross boundaries are deviant. So, for uh, in Western Europe, the Romani people, who are pejoratively known often as the Gypsies, these are people who are thought to, to cross between, for example, state borders and different cultural areas, and therefore they are framed as deviant by by the settled populations in Western Europe. And similarly, in Ireland, the travellers are framed as deviant because they don't um, because they cross borders such as between Northern Ireland and Ireland and over to Scotland and they're always on the move for example so uh, stigmatization results um, it also in today's multicultural societies it also um, occurs in relation to the wrong food so for example if you uh, a Westerner living in certain really strict Islamic areas, you will be thought of as a kafir, an infidel, because you eat pork. Or in certain observant Jewish areas, people who eat pork are thought of as part of the goyim, the um, the other people, the the non the the, dis the people who don't belong. They're stigmatized. England, French people are sometimes called pejoratively frogs because they eat frogs, and th there's a food and frogs don't fit into the English categories and therefore are thought of as disgusting. So people who eat the disgusting food are disgusting too. And similarly, um, anti-Chinese sentiment sometimes focuses on the idea that Chinese people eat dog. Um, it's not all negative. It's mostly negative, but not all negative, because sometimes those things that are thought of as, uh, that don't conform to the, bound to the orders or classifications or categories of society or to put it in terms of this course, in terms of the symbolic order of society, things that don't fit into the symbolic order of society, are sometimes invested with spiritual power. So I'm taking from this famous quote from Shakespeare, who imagined that witches would say th such things as, in the cauldron boil and bake, eye of newton, toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm sting. So you got a... Uh, Worms, things that go in and out of the land, uh, adder, a reptile um, with a tongue that's split in two, which should actually be one, according to English ideas of what a tongue is. Uh, frog, of course, we've been through that. Um, also, you get things here, a, a mummy, something that's alive but dead, doesn't really fit in the categories of properly dead things. 
the shark of course um, in English categories it doesn't have scales and it's in the sea so it's something that's sort of filthy disgusting but also spiritually powerful if we go back to um, Elizabethan England so in other words if we go to Elizabethan, Elizabethan England look at the things which defy the categories with which um, the people of 1500s in England divided up the world then we find uh, those things that do not fit in the categories are disgusting and awful, but also might also possess spiritual power. And in, a, in several religions, um, small-scale religions in particular, we find that uh, transgender people actually are believed to possess significant spiritual power. So, for example, amongst the Bugis people of Sulawesi, there's the Bisu, uh, who is a priest, and the Bisu is a combination of male and female, male and female, so it doesn't fit into the set categories of man and woman, and therefore um, has deviates from the norm, but is also invested with spiritual power and, and to a certain extent is honoured. Similarly, um, uh, the travesty, the transgender priests of the Candomblé, sort of indigenous religion of Brazil, uh, um, are thought to have super more powers than ordinary men or women. So, to conclude on Douglas, our systems of ordering or classifying the world seem natural to us, but they are imposed on the world, and they never fit perfectly on the world. And they are imposed differently in different cultures, which means that there are gaps or leftovers in most categories. And those are the ones that are identified with filth and abominations, and sometimes also then with stigmatization or spiritual power.